it's absolutely superb to be here talking for Watkins Books, uh, such a, an old, fabulous uh, bookshop, a, a real centre of esoteric knowledge. Of course, Watkins Books has as its symbol Thoth, uh, or Dehuti, the Egyptian god of magic and writing. And you're going to see that this great deity appears as part of our, our talk today in many different guises and forms. So I'm going to start off by, by sharing a slideshow, because they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And you don't want me to talk that long. So today we're talking about the hermetic art of memory. And I'd like this to be a memorable talk. But in order to ensure this, I need your help. Today, I'm going to be discussing all sorts of things. You're going to meet great practitioners from the past, hear about historical events, read quotes uh, by uh, different people, saints, or uh, great practitioners of the memory arts. But the goal isn't for you to gain any of this information. If there is something that stands out and it remains in your mind, that's wonderful. But what we're really looking for isn't information, it's inspiration. So as we explore memory, we're going to go very close to the nature of human consciousness, to the hidden forces that underpin all the hidden and mystical arts. During this exploration, there may be something that stands out, that has resonance, which really lifts you up. When you find that, a new way of looking at something, a, a greater understanding of your own consciousness, a empowerment uh, from outside in, I want you to press it firmly within your heart. Make it your own. Culture it and let it grow within you. And then you will be practicing hermetic memory and be gaining what the potential that is offered here truly is. The basis of this talk is this book, The Hermetic Art of Memory. If you are aware of the art of memory and its uh, more ambitious applications, you will also be aware of Giordano Bruno, the Renaissance mnemonic practitioner and heretic who came to Great Britain or to the British Isles, I should say, and who taught and wrote during his time here. Bruno is understandably very cautious in his writing, and he's very flamboyant in his artistic nature. So his techniques are there, but few people can really understand him. His student, Alexander Dixon, who was a Scottish member of uh, the Scottish Royal Court uh, of James VI, uh, to become James I of, of England as well. He is less hidden. And I think that the environment in Scotland was a bit more open-minded. And I think uh, Dixon's way of thinking was a little bit more direct. So, Dixon was a brilliant apprentice to Bruno. And so much so that the two men really felt 
they bonded, which is which is good because Bruno didn't get on with many people. Dixon became known in Scotland as the man who'd restored the Druidic art of memory. Any form of memory which had a a hidden connotation became called Dixon's art. It was said that Alexander Dixon could recall your memories, could remember things from the future as well as from the past. It was said that he remembered where William Wallace's boat was and managed to uh, regain it. Excellence and genuine ability is the focus of Dixon's work as well. The actual text is a prosopopoeia. It's a, a writing uh, whereby he imagines what would happen if Socrates met and uh, some of the characters that Socrates is made to mention in Plato's dialogues. Sounds complicated. Just imagine a circumstance where the Egyptian god uh, Thamus or Amun and uh, the uh, god Thoth, I told you he'd be coming later on, were to be able to talk to Socrates about writing and memory. And the focus is on genuine ability rather than being able to come up with a clever concept to avoid uh, questions which are awkward. But within these two manuals, which have never been translated in their entirety into English or published before, you will find uh, Bruno's methods in a Dixonian manner. You're probably aware that Bruno's most famous book is The Shadow of Ideas. And of course, his apprentice honored him by calling his book The Shadow of Reason and Judgment. Now, I could uh, talk for another 30 minutes just on this fascinating work. But today, I'd like to give you a little bit of a, a tour of what you would be learning if you were Dixon's student. You could actually do this. You could become a student by paying, it was seven sovereigns, and you would become a member of a very elite group, a group which um, were banned from the gambling houses in, in London because they used to come down from Scotland and uh, leave of all the English money because they could memorize a deck of cards in 10 seconds. And this is the kind of syllabus that I believe you would take part in. Now, I'm going to only be able to touch on each point, but be reassured that I'm talking as a practitioner. There's nothing I'm mentioning that I haven't tried myself. And I know these to be the exercises and the approach would be used from both the memory writings of practitioners of the day, but also from the diaries of the students of Bruno and of Dixon, and even of some other memory masters in the same vein. So the first thing I need to make clear is that memory had a different connotation during that time. Memory is the art of creating something in your mind. So it's not to be mixed up with reminiscence or recalling something, that's part of how you, you could use memory, but it's any form of imagination, any form of visualization. And it had all the same connotations connected with it that we might have with creative visualization or hypnosis now. So just think of how nowadays we would believe that if you imagine something enough, it would create a kind of resonance or link or change who you are. Well, this was even stronger in that day. It was believed that memory made your mind. Before you, you can see a picture of some splendid looking fellows with marvelous hats. And they're Freemasons from the Enlightenment and they're sitting around what's called in Freemasonry a tracing board. And the reason why I'm showing this to you is it demonstrates the kind of belief that uh, was prevalent 
at the time of Dixon and uh, both before and after. The Freemasons here are going to memorize and speculate upon those symbols before them to transform who they are, uh, to, to build a new self, a better self, to regenerate and evolve their personalities and perfect their minds. And this is actually interesting. This is a memory emblem. This actual depiction is one for you to meditate on. And you can see there's a lot in there. The practice of meditatio, meditation, was a, a common thing. And it has a slightly different feel to it than we have with Eastern uh, traditions that we're more aware of now. Enlightenment is when a light from above comes down. It's meditation in the time is more about linking with something, joining with a higher force or gaining an insight through connection with an original idea. Now, here are our two chief consultants. We have Bruno, who I've already mentioned. Uh, there he's on the right. And on the left, we have Robert Flood holding his hand in a very mysterious position. Bruno and Flood both practiced the hermetic art of memory, but with different feel and focus. Uh, Hugh kindly mentioned at the beginning uh, that uh, I've managed to uh, demonstrate Bruno's memory art. Bruno used uh, a memory wheel, and each letter in the memory wheel, uh, the two sets of wheels, and uh, each one of them has a, an abstract hermetic or Neoplatonic concept, which is to be meditated on and joined with the next one. Sounds complicated? It is. Uh, a famous memory historian said that they didn't think it would be possible to use, and indeed they felt that it would take uh, the sense of adventure of a, a small child and the focus of a Zen master in order to do it. They should have added persistence and patience of a saint because it took me four months of an hour practice an evening to get those wheels turning again. Flood, however, was a very different character. His memory was far more of the heart than of the head. So they both approaches joined together. It was all about resonance being in tune with everything. Flood would want us all now to think about the connections in our lives. Are we listening to the right words? Are we surrounded by the right objects or resonance? Are we investing in the right people? Memory is when you recall a higher state where you get uh, to the uh, higher state of consciousness through resonance. These two agree on the process and use the same terminology, but just the feel and the approach uh, contrasts beautifully. Now, I say hermetic art of memory, but why hermetic? When Massilio Ficino uh, translated the Corpus Hermeticum in the mid 15th century, he really started something off. The Hermetic texts were said to be written by Hermes Trismegistus, which is a composite of the Egyptian god Thoth or Dhuti, told you'd be here quite a bit, and Hermes or Mercury. The whole text begins with a spiritual experience. Once, when thinking on the things that are, a great tiredness and sleep came across me. Not the kind of sleep you get from eating too much or from too much physical work, a different type of sleep. He's going to a, a deep state of meditation. Then my body became heavy and sunk to great depths as my mind soared upwards. Hermes begins the text by experiencing 
a oneness with the divine mind. And this oneness is a great blessing to him. It's something he, he engraves in his heart. He remembers from then on. And what he discovers by seeing the creation of the universe and by this, this, this pure experience of oneness is that everything is formed of pure consciousness. So the objects around us that we can touch are same as the objects we can visualize in our mind, just a matter of density and ability. These texts claim to teach the original Egyptian path. And many people found them to be empowering and generally inspirational. Now, the memory practitioners of the day immediately saw them as being connected. Hermes is a messenger, and of course, all messengers practice memory. Engraved in my heart, he, he engraved it. And after he has remembered this image, and after he's remembered this experience, he, Hermes has gained certain powers. There's a peaceful silence within him, and his words make what he says happen. He gains a, an insight, can see the hidden world. The memory practitioners at the time took that hermetic principle and came to a great realization. If all things are made of consciousness, then a memory is an imprint of consciousness in me. But if I could imprint that, if I could take that memory technique and I could use that, I could imprint it outside. Would that be an enchantment or a, a magical transformation? If I form a memory palace, a building in my mind, that's very good for, for memory and for recall and for insight. But if I was to form it outside, is that a magic circle? Would that change what happens externally? With this in mind, they read the Hermetica in a way that only mnemonic practitioners could. They were well used to a Christian memory practice when in their memory palaces they would put statues of saints or angels in order to bring virtues into their consciousness or to recall biblical information. Suddenly they were reading instructions as to how you could build statues, as of course we know the ancient Egyptians did, and draw divine powers into them. If they were to, if they were to build those statues in here, what would happen? Would they become gods? In order to start such training, we would need to have a good control over our existing ability and consciousness. And if we read, the advice of practitioners, uh, both the Renaissance ones I'm talking about now and, and those uh, from long before, the beginning of your training starts with a, a change in the way you view life. We mentioned a mnemosyne, uh, the goddess of memory earlier on. And it's quite interesting when the Neoplatonic practitioner uh, Apollonius of Tyana met the yogis, the Brahman, they said to him, oh, you worship the goddess of memory too. And they were talking about respecting memory. That's, that was, that's the true way to, to worship that goddess, is to actually respect memory and have an aware, focused life that cultivates it. So these are the kind of things, if you were to start your hermetic memory training, you would learn to get this consciousness raising and to increase your abilities. 
keep in mind as you as you hear these principles that if you read the diaries of the practitioners and their expectations and experiences it is an awakening that they were going through it was almost like if if you were to start to gain the uh, observation skills and deductive ability of Sherlock Holmes but also gain the ability to be empathic and to persuade like Darren Brown and also have the kind of inspirational kind of ability to compose or artistically create uh, as Mozart or Picasso all in one that's what they expect this stage to start to bring around So what do you do? You start to make a full, aware, engaged effort to everything you do. So right now, as I talk to you, this is me training in memory and eloquence. And as you listen, this is you training in insight and awareness. Every moment is one whereby you can improve and bring goodness into the world. Nothing is trivial, everything is important. In a sense, the memory practitioner sees everything as having resonance. Every word is a spell, every object is a talisman. In truth, it's all powerful and important. These are our ritual robes this is the most powerful influence we we have with us at all time in addition to this a new resolute powerful inspired attitude towards any form of mental challenge so it's a little bit different for us now uh, so I'll give you some modern examples. A memory practitioner should let go of anything that's supporting them they don't need. You need to rid yourself of excuses not to engage your mind. If there's a maths problem, don't use the calculator. If you've driven there two or three times, no more sat nav. If you keep looking the same thing up, the third look up means memorize me. Use your mind in every moment. And as you can see later on, there's a, a few other things uh, a bit like this as well. Another opportunity is when someone asks you to recall a past event. People who bail out early, who don't make an effort, they're not practicing that long term filing system. They're not asking for that recall. So, Next time someone asks what happened two Christmases ago, don't focus on what you can't remember, focus on what you can and keep, keep trying. Use it as a challenge. Everything is a opportunity for you to develop yourself and for you to help your mind know that you want to keep raising its abilities. And finally, use natural memory palaces. So there are many things in the world which are set up to allow you to memorize things about them. If you want to learn about botany, walk through your garden with a little pilgrimage that always takes the same route, stopping at every plant, memorizing what its name is, what it's good for, what its qualities are. If you want to learn about a religion, go to the church, go to the temple, use every icon, every picture, every stained glass window, every decoration as a lesson. You want to learn about biology? Use your body as a memory palace. Look for these and embrace them fully. Now, in addition to all this, this change of attitude, this change of approach to life, we would also start to practice certain exercises. Now, this is a really wonderful ancient one. You can see this in the earliest records of the Pythagorean tradition. And you see this generally engaged with by the memory practitioners that we discuss. What you do is every evening before you go to bed, you 
Make sure you're upright and seated. Uh, don't lie down for this. You'll start to go to sleep. Upright and seated. And you go through the whole of your day. And you recall everything that happened in as much detail as you can. Use this to iron out any things that you find tough. Focus on your lack of ability rather than your advantages, and you'll do really well. So anything that in life you find a bit tricky in this meditation, empower it. Balance lies with practicing what you find hardest. So if you're not good with dates, start with a date. Sit down and say the date to yourself. Then go through the day recording every single conversation, every email you sent, every phone call, every job, everything you ate, everything you did. It is such a refreshing, powerful thing. This allows you to critique your day in a way you, you don't normally get to have a chance to see everything that you did well, that you're going to amplify in the future and everything where it could be improved that you want to grow into a better expression. Make sure you've got a sense of light, joy and savour that day with a sense of thankfulness. Take note of what you're going to improve and then it's time for sleep. This exercise in and of itself has all the benefits of meditation uh, but much more in the sense of memory improvement and genuine empowerment to your life and a, an addition of skillfulness to your abilities. These tiny adjustments allow you to keep doing everything you're doing better. Soon you're going to find that you achieve a lot more than uh, you used to because you've recognized those inefficiencies and you've evolved each and every uh, task to the next level. Now, one alternative to the Pythagorean meditation, the meditation that Pythagoras would have his students do, is what I call the Druid memory walk. Now, it's never called this, but you do see this kind of training appear. The idea is that like the Druids of old, who were known for their memory, you would learn about your surroundings. Now, the focus is often nature-based, but not always. The idea is once a day you'll go for a walk and it's awareness on. The moment you leave your door, you're scanning the colours of the doors next to you as you go past other houses, what cars are there, where the lamppost is, where the bin is, everything like that. And you can just get to the end of the street or whatever location you're doing. You can walk through a woods, you can drive somewhere. When you get to the end, you stop and you repeat the walk with as much detail in your imagination. Both parts of the training are superb. The awareness to take it in is lifting your awareness and response time. And it's something you'll see coming into everything you do. And remember, of course, everything you do is already training. So everything is feeding into, it, into each other. Likewise, you'll find that your recall for small things starts to, to go up. It, it's like a new posture, sitting back with your, your shoulders back or doing the right posture in your gymnastic or yoga uh, practice. It brings it into your life. This new awareness and higher memory starts to appear in your life. During all of this, you are going to be learning to master memory images. A memory image is when you use a shadow, that's the, uh, the terminology that Dixon and um, Bruno would use. You create a, an image that represents something you would like to remember. And it's one that's deliberately made to be memorable. So it needs to be shocking funny, rude, surprising, uh, something humorous, 
uh, play on words are really good for this, or um, pop references. And this allows your mind to hold on to it. This is actually a very powerful thing because it works with how your mind works. They've done some wonderful tests, some great uh, scientific tests to show how powerful this is in terms of daily life. If you do a, an experiment and you have one group of people meet Mr. Mike Baker, and he says, hello, Mr. Mike Baker to them, and you have another one come along, same person, but he says, hello, I'm Mike, I am a baker. The group that met the baker, Mike, who is the baker, will recall Mike the baker. The first group will stumble. Matt, Butcher, Marvin, Barker, they, they'll get confused because there wasn't a strong image. So you're going to artificially make those images. When you make, want to remember Michelle's name, you'll remember Michelle. Maybe you imagine a nose looks like a shell, you know, it, it, it would stand out. You want to remember my name, Martin, my tin. Maybe you think, oh, he keeps gesturing with his hands. He's holding tins. Yes. You meet Mr. Cooper. Coopers make babbles. You imagine him in a babble. And you can do this for anything. It really is a powerful way of getting this into your mind. Now, in addition to that, you can use memory images as hooks to remember other things. Uh, before you, you can see a, a set of preset memory images for numbers and for letters. Think how you could remember, use this for speeches or for remembering lists. Um, this is actually um, a memory page, this whole page there that you can see with the bull. Uh, with all the, uh, with the key and a sun and everything on him. He is uh, a memory image for the Gospel of Luke. Everything there represents uh, something in that Gospel. So you can see how this was used at the time. I'm just going to explain the number, the number system for you. I think you'll find this uh, quite interesting. So here we've got a pin system. You're going to have images instead of numbers for if you want to remember numbers or do lists. The donkey. Uh, this is um, uh, Robert Flood, by the way. This is his memory system, um, pin system. The donkey is worthless. Oh. So he's zero. And then we have a spear that, that looks like a, a one, doesn't it? And a pair of scissors looks like number two and, and uh, a stool, number three. So you would remember these associations for the numbers. And there's other ones, rhyming ones, one sun, two shoe, three tree, but you get them in place. Then when you want to remember something in a list, you could use these to connect them. If someone says, you're right, I want you to go to the shops and I want you to buy um, bread. I want you to buy fish. I want you to uh, buy some ham and I want you to um, uh, bring back some beer. So where we have bread, fish, ham, beer. So you put this in your pin system. A bread, you imagine the donkey's eating the bread and you're trying to fight it, um, from, get it from it. Or maybe you're using the donkey to slice the bread. <laughs> maybe that's, you, you got a baguette and you went, went, went to get sliced bread. Two fish, you imagine you, you get to the supermarket and you need to use the spear to stab your own uh, fish. Maybe you can imagine a horrific scene where they're using a pair of scissors to cut the ham or the back of a pig. Or maybe you can imagine that you go to the, the beer aisle and there's a, a drunk there drinking it all. And he's sitting on a stool. So when you get to the supermarket and you think, right, what was I asked for? Right, zero donkey, the useless donkey. I found a use for the useless donkey. He was slicing the bread. Right, two the spear, uh, so I won the spear. Uh, what's that going to be? Okay, that's going to be, um, I'll be stabbing fish with that. Two, ah, I remember that horrific scene of cutting my own ham. Three, oh, it's going to be the, uh, the the beer, but the beer was all drunk. The man. So it's very easy to remember with a pin system. You're going to start doing this in everyday life as part of your training. All this combined, your, your life as training techniques, your uh, Pythagorean meditation or memory walk and memory images is really going to build up a foundation of memory practice. Uh, think how much 
the mind would just step up from all this. I think how things would connect. If you're a Renaissance man and you make sure that every time you sign your name, that's your calligraphy practice, your small motor skills start to improve. So rather than just doing it normally, and your fencing improves. When you do your Pythagorean meditation, you think about what you're saying and how things could be improved. This is a powerful interlinked system. Then, and only then, can you move to your, your second phase in your practice. I call this building the inner castle. And that castle picture before you is indeed a memory palace. It's made to show you all the virtues you are to build in yourself. So it is indeed the time when you are going to start practicing memory palaces now. A memory palace is an imaginary building that you use all your senses to construct and you walk through again and again, always stopping at the same locations. So let's imagine you are going to use your house as a memory palace. You could perhaps walk to the front door, location one or location zero. Sometimes they do just to, to throw things. Um, go into your to your um, the entrance hall and there's your coat hangers, you know, for your coat hooks. And uh, that's place uh, number two. Number three, maybe your living room. Maybe that could be your couch. Uh, number four, maybe could also be in the living room. Uh, that could be your television. So the idea is to create a, a filing system. And these different memory locations are where you are going to put your memory images. And this is a beautiful way of being able to recall things. So a bit like we did with the pin system, you could use this for a list. If someone said to you, okay, I want you to buy bread, fish, ham, and beer. I think that was the list I used my pin system to recall. You'd do the, you'd say, right, okay, I'll go up to my front door and the postman's posted a baguette through the door and it hasn't fitted bread. You walk through number two, fish. You go to hang your, your, your coat up and all well, the coat hangers are, are fish and you, they sort of have to bite the coat. The more surreal, the more surprising the image, the better. You go into your living room and there's a, there's a pig sitting on uh, the couch and he's watching television and every time he turns the channel it's just beer commercials very easy to remember what was bruno's secret to this bruno would have the the location for memory but he'd have a um, adjunct he'd have a secondary object to it so his door or to represent zero would have a reef on it. His uh, coat hangers would have a, um, a walking cane representing um, on, on there. And um, this would represent uh, a, another addition to that location. Maybe um, if the position was a third was a couch or a seat like that, you'd have a sort of a stool at the end or or maybe something, some other item. Actually, in this case, it would probably be a pair of scissors or something like that. The aim was to combine the pin system and the uh, memory palace so you could sandwich the image between it. So if you wanted to remember uh, the life of a famous centurion, and that was in position zero at your front door, he'd be holding the reef as his shield. This gets a little bit you know, in, interesting to explain here, but that was how they function with their memory palaces. They would have a position and an object there. But that's just for general memorization. What would the practitioner be memorizing at this point? Well, the practitioner would be practicing what is known in the hermetic path as the square art. The square art involves 
the evolution of the self. You're going to be balancing your own personality. The idea is that your personality, your whole being is made up of earth, air, fire and water. So you need to balance those. You need to be as ambitious and fiery as you are watery and intuitive, as intellectual and logical as you are earthy and solid. You need to have your, your will, your emotions, your intellect and your consciousness and instincts all in, in harmony. To do this, they would memorize emblems. Um, so before you, you can see some examples of these. This is actually a, a Rosicrucian memory uh, system. You could get this as packs of cards um, or a little book. This is by Daniel Kramer. And each one of these steps is a, one of the transformations your heart would go through. And the idea would be to puzzle these out, to really contemplate them, to really meditate uh, upon them. And it was believed that symbols memorized and mused upon and really connected with would change who you are. Remember, what goes into your mind uh, becomes your mind. At this point, I, I do want to mention that for memory practitioners who are interested in this, there is a, a modern uh, pack of memory cards that that I've produced called uh, the, the Death of, of Hades. Uh, so this is, this is uh, available for those who get to this level and want to explore it. But how uh, did this technique work? Well, we know that the connection between memorizing images and the transformation of the self goes back very far. In fact, there's a manual, it's a, it's a parody of Sophism called Disuai Logai from 422 BC. And it gives some examples of, of how you could memorize certain things and transform yourself. So the idea is a bit like this. If you wanted to be more brave, you would meditate upon Achilles. And you'd imagine the figure and you'd use him as a memory palace. Everything about Achilles would say something about uh, his bravery. Maybe you'd memorize the spear that he used to, for some heroic act. Maybe his helmet was connected with some adventure. Maybe that shield was given to him at this battle. And the more you put this in your mind, the more your mind remembers these qualities and brings them out in you. It's like a, you bring the blessing from that image in. One of the ones that makes me smile is if you want to be uh, more noble and, uh, and you want to uh, have that sort of sense of honour that comes with uh, a lion, you imagine yourself as a lion and you get all those lion-like qualities. Now, those who... Are, are aware of oriental meditation practices when there are benefits of achieving oneness uh, with uh, a, a particular image or a set of ideas will be well ahead of us here. And, but please be reassured, we will visit that subject later on. You're going to find the Western equivalent of, of Samyama uh, and, and the achieving uh, for Samadhi on, on something coming soon. In the meantime, I want to explain to you why most people who were educated in memory would be quite sure of this practice. St. Thomas Aquinas, who's a wonderful writer, you should read St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, he's definitely on the path. He's definitely doing it. It's really wonderful to read. It's really great to sort of connect with someone who's striving for genuine knowledge and genuine evolution. He believed that the memory of a symbol was very important, if not invaluable, for any change of character. And that's because, uh, I'm not going to read his quote, I'm going to translate it into modern words. It's because your mind doesn't like 
abstracts. If someone, if you just, someone says to you, can you do this? It just sort of floats past. If you want it to hold in your consciousness, you need a symbol. That's why we have a wedding ring. That's why we sign a contract. That's why you need a symbol. If you're going to take a vow, put something on. You put a bracelet to remember that, to put it in, in, in your mind. He believed this is because it, it connects with our, our estimative ability, our, our subconscious, as it were. That's the kind of term they had for the animal self then. Now, these, this idea that corporeal similitudes, symbols, would transform us by going into our deep mind have been well tested and well thought out in hundreds of years of memory practice within the Catholic Church. And Albert the Great, St. Albert the Great, who's St. Thomas Aquinas's uh, teacher, he said that the mechanism was similar to when you learn from a big experience. The example he gives, and I believe this is from his commentary on the anima, uh, which is Aristotle's work on the soul. The example he gives is if you, you're walking through uh, woodland and you get bitten by a wolf, you don't need to rehearse. They don't need to remember that much, do you? It's just there, deep in your mind. Even if you don't even consciously think of it, you're going to be a bit more cautious in woods from then on. He said the same was possible if you were to meditate on an angel of truth. If you were to remember the angel, go into everything about it, so your focus is through memory, that's why you, your mind doesn't drift. You remember the angel's name and their clothing and what the angel wears and what each bit symbolizes. You remember a poem. Eventually, you will connect with that, with a state of ecstasy and oneness. And then you'll never lie again because you become at one with truth in its original form. The practitioner at this level would be deliberately upgrading their mind consciously like this. They'd be spending time memorizing memory palaces of all the syllogisms of logic or all the principles of, the, of um, eloquent speech or rhetoric. They'd be memorizing artistic techniques or approaches. Now you can see why they'd start to become very different in their abilities and why their excellence was shining forth so much. I mentioned this is the square path. I just wanted to show you two memory palaces uh, pertaining to this. The one on the left, this is by uh, Robert Flood. Isn't it beautiful? Robertus Fluctibus, uh, we're in debt uh, to you for this. This is the fortress of health. And you can see Homo Sanus, the healthy man, he's praying, remember prayer and memory is very close for flood. And he is remembering these four archangels of elements, Michael, Oriel, Raphael, Gabriel, and they're repelling the negative forces. And there's a direct blessing coming down on him because he's formed this memory palace. It's balancing him, it's blessing him, it's enhancing his elements and bringing positive expressions. The memory palace on the right is a similar kind of thing in the sense that they are all symbols of the elements in a, a garden uh, for Bruno. And he does put some qualities in there of each one. They're a little bit idiosyncratic, but this is again a balancing of the elements uh, through memory practice uh, by Giordano Bruno. So let's imagine this. You have taken on this path. You've developed your consciousness to your natural abilities limit. You've gone beyond that with your square practice. You have balanced the four elements and achieved excellence in all areas. And nothing lags behind anymore. You have changed the way you view yourself so that the things you used to see as beyond your grasp are now within your hand. Then it's time for the more advanced practice. You are going to connect directly with 
higher ideas. The Corpus Hermeticum mentions original thoughts. The divine mind, uh, sometimes pictured as a, a goddess in some of the earlier Hermetic uh, texts, uh, shines out uh, the original thought. It starts to think. Um, one of the most beautiful texts I've seen is where this is the smile, the goddess smiles, and this, this pure energy of creation shines forth. In there, there are original ideas. These original ideas are the elements, and they go on to make the planets. And uh, when we say the planets, the energies that we see have resonance with the planets. And you can connect directly with them. And through that connection, you can achieve these higher abilities that we started off talking about. This is the memory palace of Giulio Camillo. Uh, this is a memory theater. And this part is called the curved art. We've had our square, now we're on to curved. And the memory palaces, rather than being buildings in this part of the art, tend to be uh, based on cosmological, astrological things. Giulio Camillo used this to become at one with each one of the planetary forces. And we actually know he used this on one occasion. He was, he was actually in a park um, in Paris and there was a display of rare animals. And a lion got out and it started mauling people and him and his friends were there. And as the lion came towards him, he entered into his memory theater and he went and walked up the steps of Tiferet to become at one with Apollo. The solar force became his and at one with the sun, the lion knelt before him and was subservient. Having hurt others, it allowed him to stroke it and did what he commanded because of course a lion is a creature of the sun. Now, I actually believe this to be a real account. Um, if you have a look in my book, The Mosaic Palace, you'll see I actually found a reference to a private diary of someone who was there. And what makes me smile about it is, is one of his friends, and his friend said in his diary, yes, Giulio Camillo, he did work the miracle in the park everyone's talking about. But what no one else knows is the only reason he had to use magic was because he was too fat to run like the rest of us. There you go. Friendship uh, between men hasn't changed. You can work a miracle and uh, someone's still commenting on your waistline. How does this work? Through contraction. This concept of contraction comes from a quote, a quote which is from Plotinus, from Massilio Fettino's translation of Plotinus, that says, when a mind rests upon a force that is higher than it, there is a contraction that brings them both together. Before you is a di diagram of this happening. The heart, which is black, is not open to the higher force or what it's uh, tuning into whereas the other heart is and receives that ray of uh, pure blessing and energy. This is, contraction is samadhi, it's oneness of, the, of yoga, but this is the uh, equivalent in, in our memory practice. Giordano Bruno lists many techniques for achieving contraction, including holding a posture or, or fasting, but for him, pure focus, Pure meditation is the only right way to do it. For flood, it's about opening yourself up. Imagine a tradition of meditation where you don't really mind what you think. You've just got to get in tune with it and let it in. If you want to become at one with love and find uh, the planet Venus, you sit with your teacher. The teacher lets the planetary rays shine into them and you follow uh, because you can, you, can, you can sense their ability, you can imitate that. That's the kind of uh, Robert Flood kind of approach. But both achieve this contraction where you become at one with that. Um, you'll see in yoga texts, 
the description is very similar in the sense that they'll say someone that's at one, if someone becomes at one with um, an elephant, it says in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, to gain superhuman strength, you need to meditate on the strength of an elephant or to know the positionings of the planets, you need to meditate on the sun. This practice of oneness through the mind becoming at one with exists in, in all genuine spiritual traditions. Um, and I've, I've got to make this clear. Memory, the memory wheels of Bruno contain as detailed instruction, if not more, than any yogic or Buddhist text I've read. And his classification of different types of contraction go beyond the different types of samadhi. He really lived this. To the, and this was his life's work with the focus on, on this uh, practice of memory. I talked about memory wheels. This, uh, if you have a, a search, you'll see I've, I've done a whole talk on memory wheels, and it's really beyond the scope of this talk for me to go in depth. But the, the rotation of these memory wheels is a way to keep your mind on something fully to achieve that contraction. Imagine if, if letter A here was going to be forgiveness, and each letter or number has an association for you. You could sit there and say, right, A, forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. A, A, forgive me. You meditate on forgiveness for the self. A, B, forgive my family. A, C, forgive uh, my friends. A, D, forgive strangers. A, E, forgive nature. A, F, forgive God or luck or forgive your enemies. You'd go through this. It's a very easy way to become at one with something. You can, you can do a meditation uh, that lasts a considerable amount of time. Uh, Bruno's wheel to rotate. If you, you have a, a search, you'll see uh, my demonstration as well of Bruno's wheel. Uh, this took um, over seven hours to perform, uh, just to rotate his wheel in a manner um, it, which is analogous to what I've described here. The memory practitioner will be working up a hierarchy. They'll be starting on things which are easier to come at one with and moving to higher aspects. The most popular of this would be orders of angels. And uh, these are seen as very positive thoughts. Christianity taken on that Neoplatonic idea of original thoughts and the archangels were those original thoughts. Now I've got to add this in here. This is John Dee's hieroglyphic monad. If you read the monad, D says that you need to put this into your creative memory. And there's lots of contemplations on this. Reading the diaries of memory practitioners, I've discovered that they viewed this as the same as Bruno's memory wheel. You would be practicing becoming at one with the moon through contemplation, through contemplation, through contemplation. And then you do Venus, you work up the planets, a bit like I was talking about working up the hierarchy of angels. And eventually when you got to the top, then you would join them all together and be at one with them all at the same time using the monad. Wow. Imagine what that would be like, being at one with all the original forces here. This is called the golden chain. This is the code you'll see in memory text. Um, there are a few other golden chains mentioned in uh, the Hermetic Art of Memory. Here you can see the, uh, the order of existence, uh, this golden chain, uh, coming at one with stones and then one with plants and practicing with animals and then moving on to ideas, uh, angelic figures. That's one path. I mentioned the planets. Most people will be aware of the tree of life. Dixon was recommending the mansions of the moon, uh, the, uh, the uh, dickens of the zodiac. For him, uh, these, the constellations and the different stars and the points in the sky, this was 
this is the, the chain that you would walk up, gaining empowerment as you went. Each area, each star having its own quality and its own blessings as, as you went until you were capable of increasingly subtle meditations, experiences, and expressions of that in your, in your daily life. So and now we have walked our own golden chain. And may I offer my sincere hopes that during our, our journey, you have found a few blessings which you have managed to take and place firmly in your heart, to keep in your memory as a blessing for you in the future. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so I've actually written a whole book which is about this uh, called A Mosaic Palace. I think uh, you may have uh, heard of it. I think I mentioned it. Here's, here's a copy. Look out for this. I do believe that there is a, an influence upon Freemasonry from uh, Giordano Bruno. I've even found some quotes of Bruno's in the, uh, some of the Masonic lectures from uh, which were practiced in the late 1700s. But I think we should remember that the art of memory wasn't just Brunonian. In Scotland at the time, they had Driver Abbey and they had Kell Winning, which were copying Christian memory manuals in which you were to visualise yourself as a master builder. Uh, they were inspired by a, um, uh, a quote in Corinthians that says, you, if a good Christian should render yourself as a master builder and you should make, you're basically going to make yourself a, a temple to the Holy Spirit. Well, they took that literally. So I think probably the stonemasons, they, they knew this uh, memory art from the people they're working for. And there are many laymen, you could join the, um, a, a monastery and not be a full-time monk. You could actually have a job. You could, it was kind of like joining a, on, on a more gentle level. And many of them were stonemasons. So I think probably the Christian art of memory was the main influence on Freemasonry. But the hermetic art of memory uh, put a flavour to it. It was, uh, it was the, the cherry in the Coke in this drink. So um, I think there's, there's some influence there. Uh, so do have a look uh, at that book and uh, let me know what you think, whether you think my assessment is correct. The, the borderline start to, to change here. So there would come a point where their memory palace or the palaces they're practicing could be accessed on such a level that they kind of start to access what you're kind of thinking about dreams states there. And uh, likewise, um, though I've never seen a, a reference to going to sleep to, to get there, if you read what they're doing, it definitely has the same kind of disciplines and challenges that we'd modernly associate with lucid dreaming, making sure as they get deeper, they're going to try to keep awake, keep in the moment. Um, the palace actually starts to change for the practitioner as well soon you've built this framework but then you start to see how things really are with whatever you're working with it, it becomes alive and that's that's sort of part of that that journey so i think it's wonderful that you've you've seen that link there i should have mentioned bruno did write a, a text on interpreting dreams which i don't think has been translated in in english it's very short but um, I've seen a, I, I've been, it's been translated, but not published. So the, he certainly had that interest. Yes, the images are surreal. And the borderline between 
a talismanic image where you're putting everything together because it has resonance, because if it has resonance, it has is memorable. And memory images can get very strange. So a memory image is deliberately going to be jarring or shocking. And people find the things that work for them. And sometimes it can be very individual what works for them. I personally keep things separate. So I have a memory palace, which is for higher things, but I have memory palaces for more mundane things because you can end up in a, a silly situation where you're trying to remember a new word um, and you're using play on words or silly jokes based on words in order to remember it. And yeah, you can imagine, you end up uh, imagining, I think there's a, um, one of the earliest examples of this actually is a, um, a solicitor is trying to remember a, someone who has testified. So they're imagining him holding some testicles and they're imagining the rest of the case. This is a Roman case. So he's been hanged, so he's got a noose and you know he's got a hat that shows his job and everything. You can end up with some very strange images and very surrealist things, which later on people have misinterpreted. So that image, which is him trying to remember a court case, became in a mistranslation, misunderstanding, to be uh, about uh, the sign of Aries. Strange things happening. The friendships they had in those days were very different than we have now. They were passionate and they were energetic and they were inspired. So you can imagine a letter arriving, you know, from, um, they also had some, the, some uh, connections with other lords and other figures and so on that sort of come to mind. Um, and they would, they'd, they'd write about anything they found exciting. Um, I remember a um, Ro um, Robert Flood, he, he actually created a machine which was meant to be like initiatory, a clockwork machine where a statue of the music would play and a statue of a, a goddess would come out and then you'd meditate on that and it would go down and the next one would appear. And, get, you know, you can imagine their friends gathering all around this. You can imagine someone getting a... a a stuffed polar bear in their sort of library and everyone going around there. They really connected and had very close, very energetic uh, friendships. And it was, it was all about no, knowing and being. So they were after genuine, visible, demonstrable abilities in a way that perhaps our criteria isn't as high modernly. Um, how many esoteric organizations do you know that people go to because they can see outstanding, unhideable excellence in their members? Well, that's what it was like in this circle. If they saw something that would work, they'd, they'd, they'd flock to it and they were full of interest at, at, on all levels, whether it was natural magic, you know, science or astrological. Now, Dixon wasn't a big player in this. He got involved in arguments with um, the uh, Oxford University sort of came in against Cambridge and memory arts. And there was a form of memory called Ramism, which was saying, get rid of all this superstitious stuff and was attacking his teacher, Bruno. And Dixon came to his um, rescue. But I think in Scotland, he had a, a very powerful reputation. So I, I hope that, that answers your question. Certainly this idea of a golden chain, you'd have to walk up. And not so much in Dixon, but you do see in other texts, a kind of uh, a statement as, uh, statements like, Progress with this as far as your ability will allow. And even some warnings saying, don't overstep yourself. 
the practice itself, you can see from um, the practitioners' writings and from the diaries, and, and indeed from Bruno listing types of contraction and levels of contraction, is a big experience. So we are talking about a uh, meditative experience and we're talking about uh, changes in consciousness. And we need to be compassionate to that in our own training. Um, the, the whole idea of this golden chain came from a quote in the, the Iliad that says that if Zeus was to throw uh, the golden chain down from Olympus and everyone down here and the other gods pulled on it. We couldn't get him down, but he could pull us up with ease. And this became a, a concept that by resting your mind on higher things, you could ascend. And you see it in a lot of alchemical works. And it's, it's a beautiful idea to keep your mind on the highest ideal and the best outcomes and to keep increasingly moving up with, uh, in your contemplations. Uh, this, is, this is that way. Um, the process of this can be a bit overwhelming. We can all imagine that person who practiced that forgiveness meditation I mentioned, they might find that quite life-changing. Imagine if you were meditating on, on something uh, stronger. Maybe you are someone who is meditating on bravery and all aspects of bravery coming out of your personality. Can you imagine the changes? If, you, if you're, people around you are used to dominating you, if you're in a position that only maintains by that and your bravery comes out, you might take some adjustment to that. And the experience might be quite a big one. Imagine if you haven't experienced bravery in yourself much before. We don't want to be connecting with the divine idea of bravery totally in our first session. Now, luckily, there's a sort of inbuilt protection mechanism normally. But if you had a strong teacher, if especially if you sort of had the kind of floods influence where he'd, he'd set everything around you to help you be brave it'd be the right time of the day the right place the right influence you're probably meditating uh, on a an animal that represents bravery or a star sign or something it could take you just just in, uh, above your comfort level if you weren't cautious so yes there are levels and yes we must respect them The deacons, of course, are mentioned in the Hermetica and in the Hermetic text, so you can kind of see why they'd be connected with them. Um, these lunar mansions, again, there's something that, if you look historically, there are images for already. You mentioned the Picatrix, and they definitely have read the Picatrix. I think there's also an idea that this may be a direct connection. Um, there's certainly a sense that we want to get beyond an intermediary and we just want to go directly to that underlying force. And that uh, certainly if you read Flood's mosaical uh, philosophy, he believes that there's plants that have resonance with these certain forces. So you could pick a plant that's got the kind of... Um, energy that you need, that connection you need for your next step. Maybe it's one that's got calmness or inner peace in it. You could find a stone that's got that. You could go to a place or be around a calm animal. But if you can go direct, if you can imagine that there's, there's a planet or a, a star that's shining that pure, it's like a gateway to that calmness, and then reach behind it. Then we've gone beyond any tradition, we've gone beyond any teaching, we've gone directly to the source. So that's the kind of feel we get here, is that you're going to, you're going to walk up until you find it. There is also that sense that the 
images could do things. Of course, these images from the Picatrix, um, they're very good memory images, um, and they're, but they, they're also used for talismans. Well, you are the talisman. And it's the same with the images of the mansions of the moon. Let it also be known that there is an angel uh, for each one of the, um, de the, the deacons or the mansions of the moon as well. Um, this is very old practice as well. Um, Metrodorus um, Scepius, he, um, he used to use this. Um, he had 360 memory points. So he probably had the deacons and 10, maybe maybe 10 different places in there. Maybe, maybe that was kind of a bit like a, a sephirotic kind of thing going there. So these are some of the very early uh, practices. Um, I might add here, now, now we've got, I've got the uh, opportunity, that the association with memory and magic does go quite a, uh, a long way back. There's actually a Roman court case where someone has been tried for practicing the Chaldean art of memory. And it's the only time you see it mentioned, but it is a trial like he's a sorcerer. So he's, this is the Chaldean, which is the Herenian, which is the Hermetic. It's, it's, it's kind of uh, goes, goes back. Um, could you do it by timing? Yes, I think you could probably time your, your practice so you are always working on what the current mansion the moon or what the current uh, sign or, or what was going overhead. I do, however, believe you're, if you were generally connecting, you might find your ability puts the brakes on. So just as in the ancient Egyptian tradition, there's a journey through the Zodiac in their, their spiritual texts, you know, the Book of Gates or Book of Hours, there's that. This journey is your initiation. You might find that you need to back off a little bit and you, you can't keep to the schedule and you should be cautious with that. Um, and you should probably be doing this with a teacher, someone who can, can help you uh, and help make adjustments. Um, so yes, but with caution. So if you, if you put golden chain and my name into uh, 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 Google, you'll find there's a whole video on this. Um, and I think that Atma probably asked that before I went in depth, uh, before I, I actually gave the quote from Homer and explained that it was a step-by-step -step, uh, chain. Um, the best way perhaps I could, most people could imagine this now would be a bit like the journey through the chakras. Uh, the chakras in yoga, or maybe the Sifroth, um, this would probably be the equivalent, a, a natural step up through how you would evolve uh, if you were uh, fully engaged anyway. Incidentally, on that front, um, I have a theory, uh, which um, I'd like to share with you, that the the chakras were seen as a memory practice in the same sense. Do you remember I mentioned Apollonius Tyanus meeting the Brahman? The Brahman gave him a gift because he was a memory practitioner like them. They gave him seven magic rings. Now, myths since then have always had them as seven planetary rings, one to wear each day of the week, but they don't say that. These chakras, they're the seven in number. And if you think about them, they are a memory palace. They're temples inside. I think the Neoplatonic practitioner Apollonius was blessed with learning uh, yoga. He learned the, uh, the seven memory palaces from, from India there. <laughs> 